the Vice President and General Manager for Everything Cloud and Automation at BMC, so we're delighted that he's been able to come in for this presentation. And I'm just going to turn it right over to Scott. Okay, well thanks so much. Um, uh, excited to be here. Uh, I really liked the last uh, presentation. I thought that would be a great job to be a future because I wonder, is there any accountability in that job? You <laughs> <laughs> something 15 years out, and you say, ah, I was wrong, and by then you're retired. So, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good gig. So, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a resident, a, a recent new resident of uh, California, moved from the uh, uh, East Coast to uh, Boston this past summer, so I too. I have a vested interest in uh, how cloud goes in the state of California as a, uh, as a taxpayer. And uh, I've been uh, actively involved, we, we probably have two or three hundred uh, uh, cloud implementations across uh, the enterprise segment, across the telecom segment, a lot of telcos have built their uh, clouds using our software, and also across a number of public sector uh, agencies, particularly in the federal. Uh, in the federal space and, and, and some uh, some state agencies, and uh, been personally connected to uh, at least uh, a couple dozen of them. So I uh, have pretty good background uh, on the types of services that are being uh, offered on both private clouds, uh, best practices on how to plan them, uh, build them, and run them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Hopefully there won't be too many uh, uh, marketing product slides in there. We try to avoid that for the most part. So, um, you know, uh, just to give you the you know, what we see is, is, is some of the key uh, you know, drivers for cloud. Ultimately, <coughs> is the consumerization uh, trend in IT. You know, everything that starts uh, as a consumer technology, whether it be social or mobile or analytics, finds its way into the data center. And so many people, when they go to work in their professional lives, expect to have these same types of services uh, uh, that they have in their, uh, in their personal lives. And so we see that as a, uh, as a key driver. And so the IT organization, uh, in many ways, you know, needs to adapt to that. On the back end, I mean, that's really the cloud. The IT resources need to be much more flexible. And they need to deliver those applications or services uh, at a much faster rate. You know, a lot of people assume the driver for cloud, in many cases, is cost. Yeah, sure, there is a cost-saving element <coughs> to implementing clouds. But the real driver is to get services out there more quickly. Uh, most of the implementations we've done, uh, you know, the ultimate business gain they got is instead of pushing an application out there uh, for production-based cloud services, you know, every six weeks, hey, now we can do it every six days. So it's it's really driving the speed in which applications get out there, uh, and then to have those things available, uh, you know, in a self-service way. You know, from any time, anywhere, from any type of device, and that's ultimately, you know, the transformation that you know many organizations are trying to drive inside of IT. And so, when you get to cloud, it's really kind of a forcing uh, a conversation between uh, you know the business, or in your case, the uh, you know the different uh, agencies or departments that you may uh, support uh, in the IT uh, organization. I mean, we see most of the uh, drive for cloud. You know, coming from the business side of the organization, because what are they doing? There, there's basically uh, shadow IT going on in many of these groups, where they're taking advantage uh, uh, of cloud in the form of SaaS, right? So, you know, applications that are now available through you know web-based services, and developers are obviously taking advantage uh, uh, of cloud resources through things like, say, Amazon. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you talk to a CIO and, and say, are you using Amazon? They say, no, we're not using Amazon. And then you can show them the Amex, you know, reports of all the different uh, accounts that their company has uh, has opened. Uh, and so, uh, in many, and, and even in, in, in the federal agencies, it's a lot more, uh, uh, it's obviously uh, much more governed, but, you know, Amazon's biggest new office that are opening up is in Washington, D.C., so you can see the public cloud resources. Uh, you know, being used there. And so uh, it's being led by uh, the business organization using SaaS, and so now the IT organization is saying, okay, I, I need to be in, a, uh, I need to put up my own private cloud, hybrid cloud, and deliver my own applications, whether they be off-the-shelf uh, applications like, you know, a SharePoint or Exchange, or my own custom applications 
you know, over-the-cloud-based uh, services because I've got this forcing function with the business that's going to go do it, you know, anyway on their own if I don't start offering those services myself. And so, you know, on the business side, you're saying I need it faster. On the IT side, you're, uh, you know, historically saying, hey, we have a process for this. Uh, you know, on the business side, you're saying, well, if you, if you set up this kind of cloud service, you need to support the unique apps that are in my business. And then you have the IT organization saying, well, we can maybe have a very thin offering that we offer, and it's going to be standard for all of you. So you got pressure there. Uh, you've got the business saying, hey, I want the same assurances on reliability and security that I had before. Uh, you're having the IT side say, well, I can't, I can't be held to a you know, particular SLA on performance, and, and boy, even if I made one up, I probably couldn't measure it very well with the systems and tools that I have today. Uh, and then from a costing perspective, when you implement a cloud, the business is saying, well, I, don't, I only want to, you know, I don't want to invest in this uh, massive set of centralized cloud resources. Uh, I want to make sure I only have to pay for the resources that I actually consume. And central IT is basically saying, well, I, you know, I don't have a good way to make meter usage today. I could do it based on headcount, or I could do it based on you know, the number of applications in production, but you know, I don't have a way to do it uh, you know, from a metering perspective. And so it's really forcing a, a conversation uh, between the two groups, you know, unlike uh, any uh, before. And, and I, I think many of you have, who have started to investigate realize that you know, cloud is not just another you know, IT project in the organization. It's pretty, it's pretty transformational. So um, this is uh, actually uh, from a Forrester uh, survey. It, it talks about the, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's basically a survey of uh, uh, business uh, and, and uh, public sector agencies with 1,000 employees or more in both the business side uh, and, the, uh, and the technical side. And on the upper left-hand quadrant is basically the business concerns, and on the lower right-hand quadrant uh, is the IT concerns. And the net of it is that uh, the things that uh, are concerning uh, IT really aren't uh, concerning the business. I mean, the business wants to move very, very quickly uh, to move to cloud-based services. IT has a lot of concerns. Hey, can we, can we offer the same reliability? Uh, are some of these legacy apps we have uh, suitable uh, for the cloud. Uh, am I going to be able to figure a way to charge people for them? And so, but the net of it is that, hey, IT is pretty worried, but the business wants to move, uh, you know, much more, uh, you know, much more quickly. Uh, you know, security is one of the uh, one of the big ones, uh, and, 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 and and applying to the strict security standards. But you know, FISMA and FedRAMP and many of these agencies are you know pushing hard on cloud services and putting those standards in place to support it. We see uh, a maturity curve that most customers go through uh, when they start to offer cloud-based services. Uh, and the first, on the bottom of that maturity curve, uh, is uh, virtualization and automation. I mean, I, 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 I always use the phrase that if you know, virtualization and automation um, you know, have a baby, the baby would be named cloud, right? And those are kind of fundamental prerequisites before getting into uh, cloud-based services. So I think the virtualization dimension is probably pretty obvious to everybody. You're not going to be running a cloud uh, on a bunch of physical uh, resources. Automation may not be so uh, obvious to most folks. So if you don't have, uh, uh, if you're going to try to set up a cloud on a virtualized environment and just stick a self-service portal in front of it, but the underlying uh, uh, provisioning of all those resources, configuring of those resources, monitoring, remediation, capacity planning, reallocating resources. If you're trying to do all those steps uh, manually, you're not going to be running a cloud. The whole nature of a cloud is meant to be fast, dynamic, uh, quick, and, and so you know, ultimately there has to be some level uh, of automation uh, you know, in the organization uh, to make it, uh, make it happen. And that may be, hey, you may not have some fancy uh, uh, platform. Sure, the vendors like us would like you to uh, to do that, we have to have some level of automation, even if it's uh, you know some script-based automation that you're driving uh, uh, within the uh, within the organization. Uh, and then we see the next step, uh, you know, up the curve uh, is uh, what we call kind of infrastructure as a service. So, if you're going to start a cloud, the the natural place to start for most organizations is a dev test use case, right? Because that's that's low risk. You're not impacting your production. 
um, environment. Uh, the developers, by nature, you know, can get excited about this stuff and geek out on it. Uh, and so it's offering uh, infrastructure as a service to the developers that are, you know, uh, writing your custom uh, applications uh, and, and, having it in, and having the notion of a, of a catalog that you can, uh, you know, subscribe to of some standard stacks uh, that they want. Uh, and then you're doing that on, you know, one or two platforms, okay? It's going to be in-house on your own resources and, you know, it's Windows and, you know, Red Hat and it's, uh, you know, VMware is the, you know, underlying infrastructure as an example. Pretty simple. Uh, to get started. Uh, and then the next step up the curve we're seeing, and again, I, I'd say this probably applies to, uh, you know, maybe 70% of the organizations that we're, we're seeing. Uh, you move to what we would call kind of a DevOps uh, use case, where you're not just providing the infrastructure, uh, but you're also starting to provide the uh, middleware uh, layer for those uh, application developers. So that can be, hey, I'm not going to just put you know, a bare uh, you know, operating system out there. I'm going I'm to have certain configurations of LAMP stacks. I'm going to have, uh, you know, WebSphere. I'm going to have Apache. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a configured set of middleware uh, supporting uh, those uh, applications. And it's probably going to be pretty well tied in uh, to my, you know, IDE or integrated development environment. And so, uh, you know, the developers can uh, sit in front of the tools that they're using today for IDE and then uh, request uh, those cloud-based uh, pass uh, platforms. If you want to get a little more exciting, uh, you know, uh, people might be using uh, 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 the actual pass services uh, that are out there, say like a Cloud Foundry or an Azure from Microsoft or something along those lines, and, and those being enabled uh, through your cloud uh, platform. Uh, and then the next stage up is what we call Cloud Ops, and that's uh, uh, effectively starting to put uh, production level services uh, out on uh, uh, the cloud. And, and, and when that happens, uh, you become much more concerned about the, uh, uh, the monitoring uh, of the cloud resources, the monitoring of those actual cloud services themselves. Uh, and then, you know, as a result uh, of some sort of performance degradation or what have you, uh, applying more resources, cloud resources, to that, uh, you know, underlying service and doing that in a dynamic uh, fashion. And then because it's tied in, uh, because it's a production level service, I mean, that's where your process integration starts to become important. You're tying it into your chain management systems, right? Because if you're in the first stage and you're just serving developers, you know, change management, you know, isn't, isn't so uh, critical. And, you know, most, most developers loathe, uh, you know, change management. And so uh, you, you're not going to need that as much in the initial uh, uh, phase to get the cloud uh, out the door. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, up to cloud brokering, uh, which for us is when you start to introduce multiple platforms. So uh, you know you're gonna you're, you're gonna have a uh, you know a VMware-based cloud over here, and you're gonna have an OpenStack uh, cloud over here, and then you're gonna have some resources. Let's say for uh, per, a classic example is for uh, performance testing of an application out in uh, Amazon. So you're gonna have multiple underlying cloud resources. Uh, that your cloud platform, uh, you know, drives, uh, and uh, and and you can support those uh, also in a uh, you know hybrid workload scenario. So, for example, maybe the web tier of the application is uh, you know sitting out on a public cloud resource because that needs to be you know uh, you know highly scalable and and deal with different loads at different times of the month and the year. And the back end database and application are sitting you know on premise you know in a in your own hosted uh, uh, data center. So those kind of hybrid uh, workload scenarios. And then the last one uh, you know up the curve is uh, you know uh, what we call kind of cost analysis migration. Uh, even in the early stages, the notion of a price for cloud services uh, you know, is, is, is critical and the notion of at least showing back those costs to your different agencies or departments is critical. But when you see people get further up the maturity curve, then they start to make brokering decisions more dynamically, right? So I'm going I'm to uh, you know, access these public cloud resources when it hits a certain threshold uh, internally or I'm going to uh, in the development process, I'm going to migrate workloads, say, you know, start on an open source platform in development like Zen, and then I want to move those workloads into production on something like VMware. Uh, and so being able to do that 
uh, dynamically and have a natural service transition there uh, would be kind of the furthest step up the maturity curve that we're seeing in, uh, uh, in customer accounts. And, and so I, again, I think it applies across uh, you know, most all types of organizations that, uh, uh, that, you know, that we're seeing. I, there is a readiness uh, factor to implement uh, cloud services. Uh, this is, a, a, again, another Forrester uh, survey. It's particular to uh, uh, government uh, agencies, both in North America and Europe. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's basically outlining a number of things around virtualization in terms of readiness. I know it's a bit hard to read. But at the bottom, it's outlining things like, uh, you know, do you have policy-based automation to shift virtual machines? Do you have an approach to chargeback? And do you have the notion of a self-service portal uh, for end users? And, and those ones at the bottom there are absolute core uh, uh, cloud requirements. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, that's uh, still in terms of adoption, you know, pretty low uh, down the list for many organizations. But, uh, you know, those are... Uh, uh, those are the staples and the uh, uh, key prerequisites for putting in uh, place uh, the cloud. I'm sure all of our California agencies are <coughs> much further ahead. You know, we're at the heart of uh, uh, innovation, and so I'm sure we're you know we're, we're an outlier on that uh, uh, chart. But uh, you know, that gives you you know some example of where many public agencies uh, are today. Um, so we uh, uh, you know have a methodology and approach. Uh, uh, to implementing clouds, and it basically is a it's a pretty simple uh, three-step process. So uh, first is uh, uh, planning uh, the cloud, uh, and 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 I'll I'll show you some uh, artifact examples from a couple customers just so you can get a flavor for it. Uh, but the first is really uh, planning the cloud itself. What are the offerings uh, uh, that are going to be put out there? Uh, what is going to be the architecture? Uh, you know, of the cloud from the, the, the resource pool perspective and, and how people will access the cloud uh, and everything behind it. I, 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 and what is the plan to, to over time leverage hybrid cloud resources? So you may not start with a uh, you know, multi-resource cloud. You may start with just, well, we're going to do it on you know, VMware to start because everybody knows VMware. But if you have aspirations that hey, we're going to have other cloud resources over time, you know, from, uh, from Amazon or Zen or what have you, build that into the plan and architecture up front. And then uh, how are we going to charge uh, uh, for this cloud? Will we do it out of the gates? Will we launch it? What I see in many cases, they put a basic service out there uh, for free, you know, to, uh, to the different agencies just to get adoption and interest and excitement around it. Uh, and then they'll, uh, you know, do showback and usage so that people know what they're consuming. And then ultimately, uh, over time, you know, start, as people uh, start to rely on it and depend on it uh, and are excited about it, then start to introduce, you know, some notion of charging, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the units. But you have to have a plan for that. Uh, and then, you know, the second step is, you know, actually building uh, you know, the, the cloud itself. So the underlying uh, resources, the cloud management platform, uh, 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 et cetera. And, you know, we see, um, you know, a couple key things there. Provisioning the complete set of, of, of cloud services, making sure you have a plan that, hey, we may start with infrastructure, but we're going to do applications over time uh, on this platform. That there is uh, an approach to um, intelligently place those workloads across your cloud resource pools because you know when you're setting up a, a cloud resource pool, you're going to have different tiers of storage, you're going to have different tiers of compute, you're going to have different, some tiers may offer high availability, others may not, and so if you imagine uh, this being set up, you're going to have to smartly place the, you know, the workloads that you're putting out on the environment. Uh, and then when you're building it, then you've got some level of infrastructure neutrality. You know, if you, if you start out with EMC and then you want to swap in you know, NetApp later, you know, do you have a way to do that in the architecture and, uh, uh, and design? And then ultimately, uh, you know, uh, third step is running uh, uh, the cloud itself. So how do you maintain the, uh, the capacity uh, of the cloud resources? Uh, what are the monitoring uh, SLAs that you're going to put in place? Uh, how are you going to tie it into any chargeback or cost allocation tools? Uh, and then how do, you, how do you drive the compliance and configuration around it? So those are the, the key steps that we see, and I'll show you a, little, a few artifacts 
uh, later. On the technology front, uh, you know, what we see as kind of the key uh, criteria uh, in, the, in the plan phase is that uh, you ultimately can have very flexible uh, cloud service de definition. I'll show you a detailed uh, slide on that. You do not want to get into uh, template mania. Uh, around your uh, cloud platform as you try to support the template and image uh, mania where you're trying to support all the unique requirements of each of the business. And so you need to have a, uh, a build time approach. I, I, you want to make sure it has a multi-tenant uh, you know, architecture uh, you know, underneath your kind of uh, uh, cloud platform because you know, ultimately, um, uh, uh, let's say it's the state of California that's uh, launching uh, cloud services. You know, they're going to have different agencies or tenants that they're going to be uh, trying to support. Some of those tenants may have their own unique cloud services that are running on that shared cloud resource pool. Uh, and so, so having kind of clear delineation uh, about what a tenant is able to do. Can they just request cloud services? Uh, can they design cloud services that use the cloud resource pool? So you know, looking for uh, you know, a system that has that kind of tenant architecture uh, in place. And then building it that, hey, there is some notion uh, you know, of a self-service uh, uh, portal uh, that, uh, that you can deal with kind of uh, the full stack of provisioning, right? There's a lot of systems out there that, hey, that can spin up uh, uh, a virtual machine. That's very easy to do. But hey, can I, can I spin up a virtual machine, then, can, then lay down the operating system, configure the operating system, you know, lay down the middleware, <coughs> configure the middleware, uh, that becomes much more complicated. Uh, uh, but ultimately, if you're going to be rapidly spinning up services, uh, you want to make sure you, you, you have some sort of system that can do that in a full stack way. Uh, network <coughs> segregation, I'll have a more detailed slide on that, but uh, that's, you know, ultimately, um, uh, IP address management becomes a big uh, issue, uh, segregating VLANs, firewalls, and each of your tenants uh, may uh, expect a certain level of network segregation from each other. So it's not just at the at the service and uh, compute layer, but it's also at the uh, uh, at the network layer. Uh, uh, and then we talked about uh, neutrality and placement. Uh, and then on the run side, uh, you know, you know, having a system that uh, you know can do uh, uh, performance management and analytics across the cloud services, because ultimately. Uh, you're going to be analyzing that cloud resource pool for performance fault, and you need to know what higher level cloud services that are running on your resource pool are ultimately uh, impacted. And the old approach that you know this used to be done uh, is you uh, put in place a model. Hey, this piece of infrastructure is related to this application, and, you, and, it, and it was a nightmare to uh, maintain those models. So you really need to have a more uh, you know, big data approach, analytics approach to monitoring the environment, uh, you know, to show patterns uh, of likely cause and effect uh, between systems. Uh, and then, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, in, in that whole area, if you think about it in the past, the way you used to do something like monitoring, uh, or the way you, in many cases, still do monitoring, is that you do a lot of discovery uh, of your uh, environment. Uh, and uh, you don't even know what you have out there in many cases, so you use discovery tools to kind of monitor what's out there. The great thing about a cloud is that since you're provisioning the cloud service, you know what you've put out there. But at the same time, uh, you're provisioning uh, that cloud service, you need to lay down your other infrastructure tools. So you need to lay down your monitoring agents, lay down your backup agents, uh, at the same time you're pushing out the service. So on the one hand, I, 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 you know what's out there, which is a big step forward, but on the other hand, you need to make sure that the system can lay down all these other um, uh, uh, kind of management requirements at the same time you're putting out the, uh, uh, the service itself. Okay, so uh, you know, those are some of the key technology criteria, and I'm gonna go through each of these uh, three steps. So on the planning phase, uh, you, know, what, uh, you know, this is not something uh, you can do on a few conference calls. I mean, there needs to be a workshop and an intervention between the agencies and departments you're going to support uh, with the cloud and, and, and IT. Uh, and, and those groups need to get together uh, to kind of define ultimately, hey, what cloud services are we going to offer initially? How's it going to be architected? What's the organizational change uh, that we need to make? Uh, to support getting these cloud services out and how do we kind of drive adoption. And for us, that's 
you know, it's typically been, um, depending on the size of your organization, but it's a, you know, it's a two to four week uh, process to, you know, basically build a roadmap uh, for your cloud, uh, uh, cloud services. And it really needs to be done uh, on the dimensions of, hey, the, the people, so how are we gonna organize the people to get this done? Uh, what are the process changes we need to make? And then finally, the last one is, okay, okay, let's talk about the technology and the tools to support it, um, uh, not, in the, not in the reverse order. And so, you know, we, and, and this is an example artifact from a major automotive company where we, uh, you know, where we put the roadmap uh, together through basically four uh, releases. Those releases were roughly three to six months in iteration. Uh, and this is the people. Uh, uh, dimension uh, of that uh, of that plan. Uh, you know, the net of it is that uh, cloud requires a reorg uh, at some at some level to make it work because IT is traditionally organized uh, inside of technology silos, right? You have the the app folks, you have the networking folks, you have the Unix guys, you have the Windows guys, you have the storage people, and if you're going to effectively implement a set of cloud services. Uh, it needs to go horizontal across all those uh, functions. And so uh, it's one of those things where you, uh, you, know, you need to put it over uh, in a corner as a separate project that has a fair amount of autonomy, that, that has some boundary uh, conditions around it, but you, you're, you're getting, what I've seen work best, you're getting experts from each of those technology silos to join the cloud team uh, to implement a set of cloud services uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for the organization. And then, Look, as you get more uh, uh, and more of uh, uh, services on the cloud, then it then it, it starts to drive a bigger transformation in terms of how IT uh, is organized. Where, in essence, uh, you know, IT starts to be uh, come organized by a set of services that are ultimately offered uh, to the different uh, business units, and then you know the infrastructure could be coming from anywhere. Infrastructure could still be at the next level down, organized by those silos, but it's really getting IT to be more organized in a service-centric uh, uh, design. And so the, you know, the first step is putting them separate, giving them some, uh, giving them some autonomy. Uh, and then you know, ultimately, uh, you know, the main constituents uh, uh, that they're working with on one side is the uh, oftentimes the app development uh, uh, group, because that's the first group that the services are often offered to, and then infrastructure and operations. I mean, those are the main uh, constituent groups that need to have a strong communication plan and so forth that are behind it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, next is the, you know, the ultimate uh, uh, release strategy itself. And then the release strategy, you know, it's essentially the, the set of uh, uh, cloud services that are going to be offered. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, in a second, the KPIs that are going to be uh, offered behind those different uh, uh, cloud services uh, and over multiple release trains. In this example, uh, they have a set of infrastructure uh, as a service uh, offerings, and then they're going to uh, implement a set of uh, platform as a service uh, offerings. And then ultimately, when they get to production, they have a lot of change management integration that they're going to that they're going to apply. Uh, but creating this kind of web processes. Uh, are going to change, and, and again, the main processes that tend to change are around how I, uh, how services uh, are requested. So the whole requesting aspect uh, and the processes around that, uh, which is very different in the cloud. You know, how you procure those uh, services, uh, and then uh, you know, second uh, is how change uh, gets done on the cloud uh, infrastructure itself, both the services that run on top of the cloud and the cloud resources. Uh, themselves, uh, and then uh, third is uh, the costing and, and funding model. Uh, uh, how the processes of charging back and doing allocation change. Those are the big ones uh, that tend to change in these projects, and, and again, they phase them out over time. In this particular example, uh, and then on the technology front, okay, you know, uh, the technology front, uh, you know, has to do with uh, all the infrastructure technologies. Uh, that are going to be phased in over time. Again, we're starting with one hypervisor and one operating system, and we're going to evolve that over time. We're starting initially with uh, you know uh, uh, flat storage, one offering, and then over time we're going to we're going to offer you know two or three tiers of uh, different storage uh, behind it. Uh, we're uh, uh, we're going to offer. Uh, 
uh, high availability option, uh, you know, in the in the third release, but not in the you know the the first release. Uh, we're going to offer hybrid cloud, uh, uh, a public cloud resource option, uh, you know, in the second and third release. So it's it's facing the underlying technology to, uh, to support it. Or, uh, you know, we uh, we're not going to offer a load balancing service in the first release. We're going to put in the, in the second or third release. And so ultimately, all of that. Uh, results in a set of service offerings, uh, you know, that are put out there. And so this is a, you know, this is a simple uh, example from this company. We're in release one. Uh, they had a lot of infrastructure as a service uh, uh, offerings. with basically just, you know, Windows and Linux. Uh, it was on the compute side. It was VMware, and then they had a, uh, you know, a simple pod structure for their network. But in release two. <coughs> They started offering, uh, you know, basically platforms as a service. So uh, they were offering database offerings. Uh, they were putting a Java application service out there. Uh, they started supporting more versions of um, uh, Windows, uh, and then their compute platform. You can see there was VMware, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft Azure. So they, they you know, set up .NET uh, developers, and so you know, Azure is very well attuned to that. And so they, uh, you know, they tied that in there again. This all driven from one cloud management platform across those different uh, technologies and across those different uh, you know resource pools, you know, giving them the flexibility to um, uh, to do that. Uh, and then you know, uh, and then you can see on the uh, uh, network side, uh, uh, the, the security starts to go up. You know, and, and before they offer, offered a simple pod, uh, they started offering network segregation. You know, in their in their release two offers that they didn't. Uh, didn't have before, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, a, a roadmap to uh, a roadmap to do that. Okay, and so, you know, then the you know the second phase. So that's the you know the plan that they put together for uh, uh, introducing their uh, cloud-based services. Uh, and then next is okay. We got to build this uh, cloud. We got to uh, you know, provision the resources to set up uh, a cloud. And ultimately, that's a combination of infrastructure. Uh, you know, a wide range of different infrastructure that you might want to be dealing with, uh, a wide set of uh, platforms that you might be developing on or servicing, uh, and then ultimately uh, applications that are running uh, on uh, uh, the cloud. Uh, because that, that, the combination of those three between the infrastructure and the platforms and the, and the uh, apps create a set of services that are offered to the users of the cloud. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes, uh, the challenge uh, in that, if you remember my comment, uh, you know, ten minutes earlier, you get into kind of an image nightmare, right? Where you know one group says, "Okay, I want, well, I want this version of Windows with this patch level," and then, but no, no, we want this patch level for you know our application, and uh, we need this you know uh, uh, configuration of .NET, and oh, you know, uh, uh, three weeks later, a new patch level comes out, and you. you you could have an endless, and so you have a central team managing this cloud. You have an endless set of images that you're trying to uh, uh, maintain, and so you know it's really important uh, if, if if there's some sort of model-based technology, uh, you know, under the covers, where hey, you define a particular service offering, uh, you know, effectively, uh, say Windows, uh, you know, on uh, VMware and. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with Apache Tomcat, as uh, uh, you, you define that kind of base uh, offering, uh, but that the all the individual underlying combinations like patch level, how much memory, how much CPU, uh, CPU, how much storage out allocation, that all gets built uh, at runtime by your cloud system, right? Rather than maintaining a bunch of images over here in the corner, is that. Uh, you know, when, when somebody's requesting a particular uh, uh, service, uh, you know, they're basically, uh, you know, filling out a set of certain attributes that they want on that cloud service, uh, and then the runtime, you know, the system is basically provisioning uh, those things uh, together. And I can just give you a simple example here. They, uh, you know, they had 14 kind of uh, higher level service uh, blueprints, like I, I described, like, you know, win Windows and uh, Windows.net and uh, you know running on VMware, but that was one service offering. Then they had another one like on you know SharePoint, and then they had another one on uh, 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 Tomcat-based service. And but in those 12 broader service blueprints, that spawned like 
22,000 different instantiations of how that how that could be set up uh, out in the environment. And you're not going to want to maintain 22,000 uh, images. You want to get that built at runtime. So that's a a critical um, uh, you know technology criteria to look at it if you're putting a you know platform out there at uh, at scale. Uh, and then you know on the on the networking side, um, uh, this is kind of uh, often you know overlooked in the implementation of many uh, clouds. Uh, and, and the challenges are around IP address management, uh, virtual LAN management. And so if you think about, uh, uh, especially all the challenges around IP addresses, uh, by their nature, if you're, if you're, if you're spinning up you know, a lot of uh, 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 VMs and instances and, and they get assigned IP addresses and then they sit dormant, I mean, you're, you're using up your allocation very, very rapidly. And so, uh, having a uh, having a system that and in most IP uh, address management today happens, you know, through spreadsheets, right? That's how it's, you know, there's some central guy who maintains the pool, he gives you a range that you can work with, and uh, and so on a cloud system, that aspect of um, uh, securely kind of segregating the network and, and, and giving each of the tenants uh, a separate uh, VLAN and, and figuring all the firewall permissions and everything like that. Uh, and then the uh, IP address uh, allocation you know, needs to be done uh, in, an, in an automated uh, way and pretty critical uh, in the uh, build uh, stage of setting up a cloud. And then uh, on the compute uh, side, it's uh, you know, having all the internal compliance policies that you might need to be in place. Uh, how many of the groups here use like the DISA uh, stakes? No, that doesn't ring a bell, so okay. Heard of the DISA states? Okay, yeah. And and so, you know, those are a set of uh, uh, compliance rules on all the different operating systems and middleware platforms out there maintained by um, uh, 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 the, uh, I don't know what they actually stand for, but it's a federal, federal agency. And so, in effect, I, I, you know, making sure those get applied at the same time you're, you know, pushing out service instances uh, in, into the environment. So again, security at the network level, security at the uh, compute level, uh, pretty critical to, uh, to consider in setting up the, uh, the cloud environment. Uh, and then I, uh, when you're building the cloud, where do I place these uh, workloads, right? You know, somebody, uh, I, I've got a cloud resource pool that's shared, and so I've got this cloud service that's, you know, Windows.net, and I've got this other cloud service that's production level, it's SharePoint. Uh, where in the cloud resource pool am I going to place these things? And you want to do that in an automated way and an intelligently based on, you know, business rules. They can be pretty simple uh, business rules at first, like, hey, you know, these applications are going to go on these resources, <laughs> these applications are going to go on those resources. It starts out simply, but over time, you're going to want to do it more dynamically, right? Based on hey, the workload in this particular uh, resource pool is under consumed, and so we're going to move some of these workloads over to over to uh, you know this set of uh, resources, uh, and we're going to have other uh, uh, other SLAs uh, in place, like on the storage tier, uh, you know, whether it's high availability and and, and what have you, uh, and so it, because this is ultimately where you optimize uh, the cost uh, for the cloud. This aspect of smartly placing the workloads and being able to shift them over time is where you really kind of optimize the cost uh, underlying your cloud uh, uh, cloud services. Uh, and then uh, uh, last is when when the cloud is running, uh, it's monitoring those uh, cloud resources. You know, I, I'd say uh, you know this area uh, you know has become much more important in the past. Uh, capacity planning, in particular. Uh, in most organizations, was like two or three guys with a PhD uh, in the corner, uh, and it was mainly in the Unix and mainframe uh, era. And as Windows, uh, you know, uh, came on board, and, and boxes became cheaper, the capacity planners were like, you know, at risk of, you know, just being, uh, just retiring, uh, because you could just throw more hardware at it more cheaply than trying to do any kind of capacity assessment uh, in the cloud. Uh, that's become you know much much more important because again you're trying to convince these different agencies and departments to rely uh, on a central set of uh, resources. Where in the past they had their app and they had their infrastructure and their infrastructure was tied to their app and they controlled their destiny. 
you're, you're now asking them to depend on the resource pool that you're supplying. And so, you know, there's no room for failure uh, on the availability level of your cloud and the performance of your uh, cloud that you're offering those folks. And so, um, uh, you know, this function of capacity planning has become, you know, much, much more critical. And it's also the only way that you're going to, you know, keep your costs contained on the, uh, in the actual cloud environment. Okay. Um, good. And then I, uh, on the chargeback, I... Uh, and reporting, you know, as I said earlier, uh, you know, the, what we've seen in this stage, the most critical thing is uh, at least doing some uh, uh, metering of the of the cloud uh, usage itself uh, at a compute and, and, and resource level, uh, and showing that back to the uh, users. But then ultimately, you know, the next phase is in, uh, integrating it back to the uh, charge back. Uh, and billing uh, systems. Uh, we often like to say that first phase is, is called a showback phase, and then the second phase is a chargeback uh, phase. Uh, you know, people need to know what their, uh, uh, you know, the resources they're consuming, whether they're dormant or not, or what have you. Uh, and, 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 and they need to see that uh, you know, through their kind of ongoing operations. So it really changes the paradigm. In the past, uh, you had a knot uh, that kind of maintain kind of the, uh, the visibility on the health of all the systems and how much utilization was taking place. And the users, you know, some developer or somebody who requested the SharePoint service, they had no visibility to that. I mean, they could go ask IT and try to dig into it, but really limited visibility. With cloud management platforms, you're starting to expose uh, their utilization, the health of their service, you know, directly to them, you know, real time, user by user, where, you know, in the past it was a very difficult thing to do. So it's important that they see uh, that consumption at the end of the day. Uh, and then last is, I, 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 in running that cloud, is uh, maintaining uh, controls I, I, with uh, process integration. So change management around the cloud uh, also needs to become automated. Some types of requests uh, you may have out there you know, may not require any uh, approval. Uh, some other requests, uh, you know, may uh, require some sort of manager or, or change approval in the system. And so what we like to say is that, um, you know, the, the cloud uh, service needs to be uh, tightly coupled with change management, but not all changes are going to require approval. You really want to have the change management system kind of documenting, uh, you know, what's happened in the cloud and the types of requests that are being made. And then oftentimes what we see, uh, say for like developers, we see people using is giving them kind of a, uh, a ceiling on, on, on resource consumption they, that they can use. So rather than you know, doing approvals around each individual request for services, it's, 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 it's basically tracking those services. And once they reach a ceiling, some sort of notification uh, goes out to kind of seek a further uh, you know, expansion of their, uh, their resource usage. Again, rather than each uh, individual, uh, uh, each individual request. And, and, and as I said uh, in the beginning, ultimately this whole change management area, if you're doing a dev cl test cloud initially, that change management connection may be very small. But as you get into production level services, that change management uh, integration is going to become much more uh, important. And again, something you want to do uh, you know, in an automated uh, uh, way. You're not going to be wanting to, uh, you know, wait for some, uh, you know, approval to uh, allocate, you know, IP addresses. You want the cloud system to do that for you uh, in an automated fashion. So we've, um, you know, this just gives you some uh, examples of some of the things we've seen around our uh, uh, cloud uh, uh, implementations that we've done. And, you know, a lot of it is around speed, so how fast you can get a new service up and running. Uh, a lot of it is around cost, uh, and it's a wide range of things. If you look like a Telstra, that's a major uh, uh, telco uh, in Australia. They're, they're basically the, think of them as the Verizon or the AT&T uh, of the U.S. And so, you know, they're uh, they're standing up their cloud, uh, you know, on our platform, and it's uh, you know based on the Cisco uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, VMware uh, at the hypervisor layer, and they also have some. Uh, another cloud that's based on Hyper-B, and they're offering a whole range of cloud services, infrastructure, platform as a service uh, to their uh, end customers, typically small and medium-sized businesses, uh, and then running uh, on top of, uh, you know, BMC's cloud management platform to drive, uh, to drive 
Uh, and then, you know, we have examples like uh, SAP. SAP actually uses our cloud management platform uh, to spin up all their kind of training and support systems around SAP in a very dynamic fashion, uh, you know, for uh, for customers. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, JDA is another uh, example of a, of, a, of a service provider. I think service provider examples are good uh, for the state because ultimately the state of California, uh, you know, is a service provider uh, to all the agencies and departments within the state. And I, I know they're probably also, you know, targeting, uh, you know, offering that service to, uh, you know, uh, uh, local and, and city governments uh, uh, as well. So, um, you know, ultimately, uh, that's where the initial rush uh, has been. Uh, the the adoption in, in private enterprise is always a bit uh, a, a bit slower, uh, but for uh, government agencies and for the service providers, that's their business. They want to offer cloud services to uh, to their end customers, and so we've seen quite a bit uh, uh, quite a bit of adoption there. Okay, so ultimately, you know, to wrap up, um, you know, it's uh, between the business and IT to do this right. Uh, you know, get a baseline set of services uh, out there uh, initially. Get started with something uh, small. Uh, uh, you know, put it in a separate organization, try to offer it initially you know, free to gain some adoption, momentum, and so forth internally. Uh, get those initial benefits out there. Uh, make sure you can, you know, deliver kind of ongoing quality of service and reliability for that. Uh, and then, you know, that will ultimately get some more trust between these agencies and so forth that are depending on you and the central IT uh, organization that is uh, delivering it. Uh, get a collaborative design approach on the types of services that you're going to offer and how you're going to roll them out between the groups. Uh, communicate those needs. Broaden the set of service offerings. You know, get into more advanced complex services over time. Uh, and, 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 and really, you know, uh, you know, exploit the IT organization for those needs. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, finally, you're, you're trying to get competitive advantages out of this. So it's, it's not just speed, cost, but hey, we can start to offer differentiating, uh, you know, services through our, through our cloud platform. Okay, good. So I think, uh, you know, I wish uh, all of you the best in uh, uh, driving your cloud uh, uh, offerings and uh, I, uh, it's something that's going to, I think it's, it's probably the biggest change we're seeing in IT over the last 10 to 15 uh, years. And it's a lot more than just the technology. So best of luck. Any questions I can take before we uh, wrap up? I think we have a minute or two. Uh, what recommendations do you have for um, staffing the support on the cloud services once you're there? If you have um, tenant organizations that want to participate, right. I suppose you're going to have a hosting hosted infrastructure in some way right so would you would you what yeah. first first line uh, first the support's always organized in levels so right. you know first level of support uh, I have a certain service out there and, and, and a team that's a uh, uh, that you know can take the call on that service and, and knows that service itself and then you know second level uh, second and third level support may be falling back to the, uh, the tech side. Do you side recommend the team coming from the tenant organization? <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah, they, they, should, they need to come out of those tech silos. Because uh, ultimately, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to embrace this in the long run. So. What's been your experience getting those um, positions from the tenant organizations mm -hmm. to host the cloud? Yeah, I mean, you're always going to have in those groups, you know, those that are, you know, more of the pioneers and are, you know, more embracing change. And so, I mean, Cloud usually built a few of exciting project to be on. So, um, um, I wouldn't say that's a huge, uh, you know, a huge challenge. It, it all depends on the top management's, you know, willingness to give the cloud to some autonomy. Yeah. What have you seen in terms of separation of duties when you've got, now that you've gone across where you have these silos and separation, you're now in a consolidated environment? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the biggest change that I kind of uh, pointed out. I mean, it's just, it's getting the IT organization to have kind of a, uh, a service-centric, you know, so What have you uh, seen in terms of achieving that separation of duties? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'd say the key uh, uh, ingredient to success there is getting people in the IT group, the ones that are leading that service, you know, having the IT background, maybe even coming out of the 
uh, the business that they're they're ultimately serving. Uh, they need to be able to speak the lingo of the business organization that they're representing. So getting that kind of person in that you know, service liaison uh, role is probably the most critical thing to making that you know making that successful. And then second is just you know starting with some simpler. Uh, you know, services that aren't mission critical right. for uh, the company. I mean, those are the, those are the two key things. <laughs> Marketing. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.